I am back for episode 17 of season 5 of the Gospel Overgivings podcast. Today I want to try and explain Matthew 24 from a dispensational point of view. Let's get after it. So the move to the new house is completed, and thank you for joining me for the Gospel of Gimmis podcast. I'm your host, Richard Storm and Norman, here to tell you everything I know and some things I highly suspect. So uh, today I want to talk about Matthew 24 from a dispensational point of view. I realize not everybody that listens to the podcast or watches the videos are are dispensational like me and that's okay maybe you'll learn something today Uh, the bible makes a whole lot more sense when you rightly divide it rightly divide it before we get into that though how are you doing i got the camera on this end of the computer screen and i got the actual thing that shows me what i'm looking at over here so that's why it looks like i'm looking over here anyway i hope there's no echo you know, I'm not entirely finished putting stuff on the wall. I got stuff behind me just so it wouldn't be just a blank white wall. And uh, I got some stuff, you know, my six foot Star Trek poster that I was finally able to have a place for. My old office wasn't big enough and my wife sure ain't gonna let me put it in the house nowhere. But I finally got it up. But anyway, I've got most of it done and unpacked. Uh, just a little bit more to go. Coronavirus update. Went to church today. That was nice. The governor uh, decided we're going to start opening some things up. My pastor just said, we're just going to go ahead and go to church. You know, we're just going to go ahead and do it. So we had church this morning. had a guest preacher, Brother Chris Campbell. And uh, it was really good. It was really good. Good to meet with the brethren again and the sistren t-shirts check it out i got my t-shirt my wife's still waiting on hers for some reason they didn't ship them together but uh got my t-shirt and i know at least one other person that ordered one i don't know who else has but i appreciate everybody who has ordered a t-shirt or plans on ordering a t-shirt uh so yeah we got two months left till the uh end of the season so we'll have a bible giveaway uh at some point in June and we're going to have you know Lord willing we're going to do a uh, Bible study for Galatians chapter 2 sometime this month hopefully that's my plan hopefully that's what happens Uh, yeah so that's all I got really for the uh, opening segment so let's get into the main topic understanding Matthew 24 I tell you, when you rightly divide the Word of God, like it tells you to do in 2 Timothy 2.15, it really starts it really starts to come together for you. In recent weeks, I've seen a lot of post-tribbers uh, use Matthew 24 to prove their point. And it seems obvious to them, I'm sure, to them, it seems obvious. Uh, however, when you rightly divide the Word, some things come to light. Some things pop, stand out. You know, right in your eyeball that uh, make you go, well, wait just a minute here. First, let's answer a very important question. When studying scripture, who is he talking to? Who is he talking to? He, in this case, being Jesus, who's speaking here in Matthew 24. uh, Obviously, as it says in verse 3, he's talking to his disciples. And who were they? They were Jews. They were Jews. Matthew 15, 24. I'm using my Ruckman reference today because it just happens to be the Bible that was on the desk. So that's what we're using. Uh, And yes, I was using this to come up with my notes along with some other things. Let me show you my new Bible. 
I got a common man's reference Bible. This thing is humongous. It's bigger than the Ruckman. Let me see here. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's bigger than the Ruckman. But it's got wider margins. That's kind of why I bought it for the wide margins. I got this in the bindery specials on Church Bible Publishers because the corner didn't take the gilding. I'm not really sure which corner it was. I think it was this one. But you can't tell. But to them, it didn't take it. And I was like, otherwise, it's perfectly fine Bible. But one of the corners didn't take the gilding, but you can't really tell which one it was. But, yeah, I bought this. It was on sale on their bindery. You know, it's usually $99. But in the bindery special, it was like 85 So I was like, well, heck yeah. I got to jump on that. I've been wanting a new wide margin. So, now I got a new wide margin. Anyway, get back on track here. Matthew 15, 24. Now, who is Jesus ministry to? He, he told us. He told us who he came to minister to in Matthew 15, 24. But he answered and said, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So his primary ministry was to the Jewish people, God's chosen people. Now, if you hearken back to, I believe it was the beginning of last season, season number four. Not 100% sure, but I think so. We did a, we did a series on dispensationalism. So, if you do not know what the dispensations are, you can feel free to go back. I might have made it into a playlist, but I'm not sure. But uh, you can go back and watch that if you don't know nothing at all about dispensationalism. I did a pretty terrible job of explaining it, but you get the gist of it. Jesus was ministering in the dispensation of the law. That is the dispensation that the Gospels are still under. We know in Matthew 5, 17 that Jesus came to fulfill the law, but that was not accomplished until his crucifixion and resurrection. So he couldn't say that he had fulfilled the law already if he was still alive. He hadn't, he hadn't done it. He hadn't died, crucified, resurrected, and fulfilled it just yet. So at this point, he's still operating in the dispensation of the law. Now, what dispensation is the church operating in? Romans 6, 14, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. Under grace. We are not. The church is not operating in the dispensation of the law. It is operating in the dispensation of the grace of God, or the church age dispensation, whichever you refer to, prefer to call it. And you know, as the saying goes, things that are different are not the same. They're not the same and that's not to say that the teachings of jesus are void to us like oh are you saying we should ignore jesus's teachings no i'm not saying that at all we just have to discern which teachings were jewish specific because after all his ministry was to the jews like it, like he himself said and uh which ones applied universally to you know to everyone to the church as well and we do that by comparing them to paul's teachings since Paul was chosen by Jesus on the Damascus Road to be the disciple to the Gentiles, to the church. So where Jesus' teachings and Paul's teachings are on the same page, then yeah, we go with them. So let's look at some key things in this chapter. The tribulation is broken up into two halves. Most people agree with this. Uh, three and a half years, two halves of three and a half years. Most of us know the first three and a half years are going to seem pretty good. You know, the first three and a half years of the tribulation is going to be pretty good. Pretty good. There's going to be peace. There's going to be prosperity. But the second half that Jesus is speaking of here, the great tribulation. The great tribulation is where things, they get pretty bad. You know, they get pretty bad. Now, some people aren't going to like what I'm about to say. Understand that. But there are different Gospels in the Bible. There are. People say, oh, the, the Gospel's always been death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Really, how is that possible before 
the death, burial, and resurrection. It hadn't happened yet. Uh, and it was pretty obvious, like I've said in previous episodes, it was pretty obvious that the Jews weren't expecting what happened. No. They were looking forward to the cross. Well, they sure didn't act like it. They sure didn't act like it. But anyway, the gospel of the kingdom that Jesus is talking about here, this was the gospel that Jesus preached during the gospels, uh, during his time on earth, and it is also the gospel that is going to be preached again during the tribulation. Revelation 7, 9-14. through 14. I'm not going to go there, but you can, you can look it up. The current gospel that we preach... 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 and 4, the death, burial, and resurrection hadn't happened yet when Jesus was on the earth. So he couldn't have been preaching that gospel when it hadn't happened yet. But he's preaching the gospel of the kingdom because the kingdom was supposed to come next. But because of the Jews' rejection of him, the church age came and the, the kingdom got pushed off. So verses 4 through 7, I'll read them. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrow. So, Verses 4 through 7 describe the lead up to the Great Tribulation because it says all these things are the beginning of sorrows. And then verses 9 through 12 describe the Great Tribulation. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another and many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. And then verse 13. But he that shall un- endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Now, does this sound like he's speaking to the church? What do we have to do to be saved? Believe. We have to believe in the death, burial, and resurrection. Does the Bible ever say that a Christian has to endure? To the end, like we have, oh, you made it, buddy. You're going to be saved now that you made it. No, we're, we're saved because we believe. But the Jews in the tribulation, their, their gospel is a whole lot different than ours. They have works and faith, just like they used to have it back in the Old Testament. And they have to endure to the end. The church don't have to do that. The church is already gone before the tribulation starts. Not to mention, how can you be speaking to the church when it doesn't even exist yet. You must endure to the end. Who? Oh, he's talking about the church, but the church doesn't even start it yet. And then verse 14, we, we read about, wait a minute, verse 15 is what I meant to say. Verse 15. We read about the abomination of desolation, which is in the book of Daniel, talks about in the book of Daniel. You can probably just follow some references on over there and read about that if you haven't which is the act that starts the uh, Great Tribulation. And we got verse 20. Let me turn the page here. Verse 20, But pray that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day, neither on the Sabbath. Now, is the church under the law? Now, I know if you're a seven-day Adventist, you're going to disagree with this. But is the church under the law? We're not under the law. I already read already read Romans where it says we're not under the law, we're under grace. So then why is he mentioning the Sabbath day? You know, neither on the Sabbath day. He prays that your journey's not on the Sabbath day. But we don't we don't observe the Sabbath day. Oh, but Jews do. Jews do. He's obviously speaking to the Jews who are under the law since he's referring to the Sabbath day. Verse 22 and except those days should be shortened, there should be no flesh saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Israel is God's elect. Now, thanks to John Calvin, many people get the idea that the elect is the church. There may be some 
There may be some references to the elect as a church in here, but I'm not sure. I think every time the elect is mentioned, he's speaking about Jews. But the elect is not the church. The body of Christ, or the church, is not mentioned one time in the whole context of this passage. He's speaking to the Jews, not the church. Verse 29 through 31, once again we see the word elect. Elect. Let me read it. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from the heaven, and the powers of the heaven shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. And once again, we see the word elect there. We're talking about Jews. The Jews that endured the tribulation, they forsook the mark of the beast. They chose Jesus over the mark of the beast. Now we understand during the tribulation, those who don't take the mark of the beast cannot buy, cannot sell. They can't do business. So basically, if you if you don't take the mark of the beast in the tribulation, you're subjecting yourself to a life of poverty because you're not going to be able to buy food or anything like that. So that is who is it is referring to here when it says they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, the, the ones who endured the tribulation, the ones who who didn't take the mark of the beast and they stood for Christ and they endured to the end and they're 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 gathered together as it says there. And a note here is Paul never refers to Jesus in all the passages. Now, granted, I understand some of y'all don't think there's a rapture of the church and whatnot, and that is your prerogative to be wrong. But wherever Paul writes about the rapture of the church, he never refers to Jesus as the Son of Man. And then verses 41 through 50, 45 through 51, keep this in mind, we'll read it. Who then is a faithful and wise servant, whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household, to give them meat in due season. Blessed is the servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Verily I say unto you, that he shall make him a ruler over all his goods. But, and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to smite his fellow servants, and to eat and drink with the drunken, the Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him, and in an hour that he is not aware of and shall cut him asunder, and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So it's referring to them as servants. That's interesting. Now, we all try to be servants of Christ, right? We all say, oh, I'm a servant of the Lord, and such such as that. And we might refer to ourselves as servants, but let's go to John chapter 15. We're going to close out here. John 15, verse, starting in verse 13. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Ye are my friends, if ye do whatsoever I command you. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I have called you friends, for all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. So when you get saved... You get, you get transferred from Jesus thinking of you as a servant to thinking of you as a friend. You go from being a servant to being a friend. A friend of Jesus. I'm not saying we don't try and serve him, but in his eyes, we're his friends. We're not his servants. The Jews, it says there in verse 15, The servant knoweth not what the Lord doeth. They don't know what the Lord doeth because they haven't accepted him. They reject him as their Christ. So they're still servants, but we're friends. We're friends. That's all I got today. I wish I could have wrote and I could have wrote another page of notes on that. Uh, but I try to keep these under 30 minutes for the most part, unless we're doing a Bible study. Uh, so hopefully that sheds some light that this verse, this passage of Scripture, people like, oh, see, the rapture doesn't happen until after the tribulation. Well, that's not talking about the rapture of the church. 
obviously so many clues throughout the whole chapter tell you that he's speaking to the Jews. The Jews, the tribulation is for the Jews. It is not for the church. It's called the time of Jacob's trouble. So the, that's the tribulation is the Jews are going to need to know. That's why there's books in here where dis, people get mad with dispensation will say, well, that book's not for you. It's for the Jews during the tribulation. Well, that's no, don't, er, er. Well, God, of course, there's some stuff in here for the Jews. So they'll know what to expect, what they got to do during the tribulation. They're still God's chosen people. He has not tossed them out, you know, like replacement the theology people think that the church has replaced them. He ain't, they ain't been replaced. Their time's coming. Their time's coming later. Right now it's our time, but their time's coming later. So that's all I got for you today. Hopefully it didn't confuse you. Hopefully you understood some things a little bit better. Matthew 24, not talking about the rapture of the church. That'll do it for today for social media links, a biography of your host, the list of places you can get the podcast. Visit the website at gospelergiments.org. If you would like to support the program financially, you may do so at patreon.com slash gospel over gimmicks. And here, let me get my hand right. Here, I guess we're doing it with the left hand now. Was it the left hand last time? Anyway, here's our patrons. Roger Water, Roger Waters, Leanna Williams, and Rusty Williams. Appreciate them. I need to go check the patron and see how much, how much money we got in there for the Bible giveaway at the end of the season. You got any comments, any questions, any show suggestions? That's a tongue twister. Gospelergimmicks at gmail.com is where you can do that. If you got hate mail, though, you can just go ahead and you can hate away in the comments if you want to. If you like what you saw today, subscribe, like, share, follow, whatever else you can do. That would be helpful. That would be wonderful. Uh, those are free things you can do. And as far as t-shirts go, I need to put, you know, I have these notes that that are for when, so I know what to say at the beginning and the end of the show. I need to put the link to the uh, store. To the Teespring store, I haven't done that yet, but I will put the link to the Teespring store where you can buy a shirt like this or a red one. They come in red as well. Uh, you can do that there, and I'll put the link to that in the description for you to find. And then eventually I'll put it up here where I can tell y'all. But anyway, that's all I got for you today. If you are not saved, let me tell you something. I went to church this morning. Got to hang out with all my brothers and sisters. Got to hear the Word of God preached. Got to see the saints of God pray. We sang songs. We rejoiced. I'm telling you, I just, you just don't know if you're not if you're not saved. You should you need to you need to put your faith in the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm telling you what, he he changes you. He changes you. You will be changed. You will know that you're his and you will know that you're going to heaven and it you, you can't beat it i mean i wish i i feel like words coming out of my mouth cannot even describe how great it is to be saved hallelujah so until next time y'all take up your cross carry on We're going to sing a classic today because we sang this in church this morning. I ain't been in church in like a month and we sang this one in church this morning. So I thought I'd sing it here on, uh, on, on the, on the joyful noise segment. It's called victory in Jesus. I heard an old, old story. How a savior came from glory. How he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. I heard about his groaning, of his precious blood's atoning. Then I repented of my sins and won the victory. O oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. 
He sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood.